right. Uh, so sorry. All right, good morning, and uh, again, so good to be able to uh, come back and uh, see all of you, even though you're not in person, but it, it just makes me uh, uh, appreciate so much more to be able to see all, the, of, all of you folks in, in person. Um, today's topic is uh, Noah, the person Noah, the man Noah, in the eyes of God, and we're going to be looking at only part one, which is Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 and 9. And uh, next week, we will be looking at Hebrews 11, verse 7. Uh, strange because uh, in, the, in the whole Bible, I, I don't think there's a word that's recorded about what Noah said. But the, the best part is that uh, there's so much written about Noah that uh, we can learn from him. And that's a strange part. All right. So we'll begin to discover what uh, God is able to tell us about Noah. And uh, from our last study, we now know the reason, the reason why God had to destroy the whole world. And it was because of the gravity of man's evil. And God said it was incurable, incurable. Because for, the old, for over the last 1,500 years before Noah, from Seth to Noah, the godly people were intermarrying with the ungodly people. And the human race has not only multiplied rapidly in numbers, but they, they have also multiplied in their wickedness, in their evil. And the Bible says their wickedness was great. That is the reason why consistently throughout scriptures, we find the reason why God hated mixing. God hated mixing. And some of the uh, examples that we see in scriptures clearly is God do not allow linen to be mixed with wool when you wear a garment. And you find that in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 11, and Ezekiel 44, verse 17. Why? Why is it that linen cannot mix with wool? Because linen is man-made and wool is natural. Then again, we see that God does not allow oxen to plow the field with donkey. You must not put them together in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. Why? You can use them separately. Donkeys and horses have been known to plow land. But you, can never, you must never put oxen and donkeys together because oxen is an, a clean animal. And the donkey is an unclean animal. And then we find God uh, uh, speaking about the mixing of iron and clay. Iron and clay. And in the context of Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, God was speaking also about intermarriage. Intermarriage between the strong and the weak. The strong and the weak. And then we move on to Ezra chapter 9, verse 2. And then it also in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. God prohibits mixed marriages, mixed marriages throughout scriptures. That is consistent. And we have the mixing of the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the wheat. And, and, and Jesus doesn't see how believers can have fellowship with unbelievers. And we get that repeated again in, in the, 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 the contrast between light and darkness. Paul says, what fellowship has light got to do with darkness? In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Let me just flash on verse out uh, for you so that you can see it. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 9 to 11. Verses 9 to 11. And here, God clearly prohibits, you shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed, or all the produce of the seed which you have sown, and the increase of the vineyard will become defiled. The word is defiled. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear a material mixed of wool and linen together. 
there you have it. God hates mixture. And this, we find this consistently throughout scriptures. And it brings us to the, the, the current picture in the days of Noah. With men still having that fallen nature, we must not forget, inherited from Adam. They continue to rebel with impunity and blatant disregard for God. They are saying, man, we can continue sinning. There's, there's no punishment. Nothing bad happened to us. Look, we are actually better. And they continue in their sin. Therefore, much as it broke God's heart, God cannot allow mankind to go on sinning. God cannot tolerate sin. God was determined to wipe out the whole human race. But against that dark background of death and destruction, the Bible tells us God raised a man. So we find in Genesis chapter 6, this is where we begin. Genesis chapter 6 verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In the eyes of Yahweh, Noah found grace because that's the what that word favor means in Hebrew, grace. And this is the only thing that matters, people. How does God look at us? And God looked at Noah with favor. What is grace? And we do know that grace is getting something, you and I getting something that we do not deserve. That is grace. And the question that we have to ask is, what is that something that you and I have received but do not deserve? Well, we say that's grace. But what is that something that we received? And that something is this the forgiveness for our sins. We get the forgiveness for our sins which we do not deserve. And this forgiveness, this grace, has been offered to everyone, to the whole world. And in Noah's days, Noah was the only one who responded by accepting God's grace. And today, you and I living in the period of the New Testament, it is still the same. Grace was the same that's required for the Old Testament saints and the New Testament believers. It's the same. So we ask the question, what did Noah have to do to receive the grace of God? Or rather, what was it about Noah that is different about him? And we read in our next verse, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. And this is the thing that is different about Noah. And if you notice that verse, three things were said about Noah. But first of all, I just want to draw your attention to um, the, the, the words in italic, which I've highlighted in red, in italics, meaning those words were not found in the original manuscripts. They were not there. But some of the translators added in to help make some sense of the verse, but it's not there. And from that verse, verse nine, it tells us about the whole life of Noah. Noah's whole life was pleasing to God. How? Take a look at those three things being said about Noah. The first thing is that Noah was a righteous man. 
And then we're told he was blameless in his time. That means as, 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 uh, for that period of time, he was alive and in his society, he was blameless. Third thing we are told is he walked with God. That means he followed God. We're going to take a look at each of these three phrases carefully. The word righteous, righteous. In Hebrew, it means just and or righteous or lawful. And in bracket, the dictionary tells us that as a man to be declared righteous or just it is up to the judicial court to decide the court must decide so you and i we may feel at times we may feel that we are righteous but it's not for us to decide it's for the court of law to decide it, it is for someone else to declare that you are righteous so the question we may want to ask is, what did Noah have to do to be righteous? And it was God who declared him to be righteous because Noah believed all that God had said. And not only that, having believed, Noah obeyed all that God demanded. And by believing and obeying, Noah's life was pleasing in the eyes of God. It was God and only God who has the right to declare Noah as righteous. And he was spared from the wrath of God, which will come in the great flood. It will come in the form of the great flood and Noah was spared. That was not the only thing that we're told about Noah. The second thing we're told about Noah is that he's blameless in his time, blameless. And in Hebrew, the word blameless means entire the integrity. He was, in, he, he, he was truthful entirely and he was without blemish. That means without spot, undefiled, upright. These are all words that would describe Noah. And you remember that this word unblemish or without blemish is also the same word used to describe the acceptable animals that were offered as sacrifices to God. Now, Relax, all right? Because the word blameless, Noah was blameless. Blameless doesn't mean sinless or perfect. Because nobody is perfect except Jesus Christ. And, but Noah's conduct, his conduct was such that his neighbors couldn't find fault with him. And it's the same was said of Jesus. Jesus found favor both with God and with man. Jesus was blameless. They couldn't find fault with him, but they had to trump up some, they had to manufacture up some faults to accuse him. So if we were to put these two words together, righteous and blameless, what are they? How different are they? We may put it in this way. We may describe Righteous, righteous describes Noah's standing before God. But blameless describes Noah's conduct before people. In other words, we may say Noah was the real deal. What you see is what you get. Noah was genuine. So, we may want to ask again, how then did Noah come to be righteous and blameless? And God gives us the answer. The answer is in the verse itself, in verse 9. 
Noah was righteous and blameless because Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. And we have to ask the question, what did it mean to walk with God? Now, you know, I, I know sometimes it may get irritating to some of you, but that's the way how I like it. I want to make sure that you answer, understand every word. And I don't want to lose any of you because I'm going to go right down to the very basics to understand simple words which we have always talked about, but sometimes we have no clue what it means. We use Christian jargon, terminologies. We throw them around and we don't understand what it means. What does it mean just when we say Noah walked with God? The word walk in Hebrew means continually, continually following with the intention to grow. There's this following and it's continuous and it's growing. That is Noah's walk. And to describe him as righteous and blameless, the person who is right before God through faith in Christ ought to lead a life that is blameless before people. Because James chapter 2, verse 14 tells us, faith without works is dead. And here we see Noah having an intimate, experiential, first-hand relationship with God. With God. Following God by believing, by trusting and obeying God. That is walk. And, and these are words that you and I, as New Testament Christians, we are so familiar with. But this has also the same requirements of God for the Old Testament saints. They are the same, same requirement. So again, we ask this question, what does following Yahweh means what does it take or what does it look like in the practical daily living what does it look like to say i'm following yahweh the new testament provides us with the answer about the life of noah the new testament gives us more details in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, which we're going to look at it briefly now. In Hebrews 11, verse 7, it reads, By faith, Noah, when warned about things not sin, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Noah received the righteousness that comes from faith. So we ask the question, what was the spiritual life of Noah like? As described in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Or, what was Noah's faith like? And we'll come to that in our next study. When we will look at just Hebrews 11 verse 7. But meantime, again, like I say, I want to make sure that you and I understand everything from the bottom up. From the very simple words. Like faith. What is faith? And we have to deal with this now because as we move on later on into chapter 12 when we meet Abraham, Abraham was also a man of faith. What does it mean? And we are going to build on what we are learning today.
Today, we're just going to look at a very fundamental question. What is faith? All right. In a Greek, faith would mean persuasion. Persuasion. And in the Bible, this word is the same for the word belief, trust, assurance. So these are common words with the same root, Greek root, faith. It, is, it means persuasion, persuasion of a moral conviction. You are, you are morally convicted. You are persuaded. Persuaded in what? In a thing, a person, or a belief system. That means faith must, have, must be directed. It has a direction. It must be directed at a person or a religious truth, a religious system. For example, if you say you have faith, faith must be directed at something. So it could be even an object, a chair. When you sit on a chair, you are exercising faith on the chair to hold you up. The chair won't collapse. It won't break. And this is, uh, well, maybe we were in Europe. We, we had the strange... Uh, encounter, we were at a concert in a very beautiful church. It was, it was a very big church, old church, and there was a, a, a concert going on, and the the, the orchestra, there were uh, woodwind and brass and all that. There were probably about 30, 30 or 40 pieces, and they were playing, and we were all keeping quiet, pretending to be uh, cultured. So we sat there, listened, and there was this huge European came in. He was pulling a chair and, and behind us. And when he sat down, the whole chair collapsed. <laughs> it was so funny. And every, everybody was shocked and um, uh, we tried not to look back, but he fell flat on the floor. He had faith, but that faith didn't hold him up. We cannot have faith in faith. We cannot have faith in faith. Faith has to be directed at a person. So let me just again uh, uh, clarify this point. It's important. Sometimes uh, we see situations where people are in hospital. Somebody got hit by a car and about to die. Young man and a wife crying and somebody will come alongside. You must have faith. He's strong. He's a good man. He won't die. And a question may be asked. Faith in what? Oh, no, just have faith. All right. You cannot have faith in faith. But this is what many people are talking about today. Having faith in faith. And that's garbage. Right? Your faith must be directed at somebody or something. So, in the context of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and the dictionary tells us that this faith must be directed at Jesus Christ. Especially our reliance upon Christ for salvation, all right? And this is what the dictionary says, not me, all right? You can find this in Strong's uh, Hebrew Dictionary. So this is faith. So what is faith? We may be still asking. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, I want to think you, for you to think of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, which is, is, is a very, very well-known verse. Think of it as a painting. Think of it as a picture. Think of it as a photo. It's not a definition that much, but it, it is a painting. It paints for us what faith would look like. Let me first read for you Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's in the King James, and I love it in the King James. So here is a description of faith. It is a painting, a picture, or a photo. And this painting gets deeper and richer in colors 
and meaning later on as we look at the lives of the others not just Noah, but Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, and the list goes on. Men of great faith. And this verse would become deeper and richer in colors. Because Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 paints for us a picture of what a person of faith would look like or how a person of faith will behave. And we're going to look at these two phrases now. First one is the substance of things hoped for. The substance of things hoped for. The word substance is interesting. In Greek, it's hypostasis. Hypostasis. And it is an important word, right? It's a very important word. But for now, we just need to understand that it is an object. It's a concrete object. It's something that is supporting some other thing from below. A setting under, concretely essence. That's the meaning from the dictionary. The word essence means it's real and it's permanent. So faith is the under support, so to speak. Substance of what? Of things, things, material things even, that we hope for. Hope for means something we want, we want to expect. We want to expect. So in other words, faith, we can say, is the concrete substructure or the concrete support for something which we hope for. It is not just the promises of God in the Bible which we hope for, like we hope for the coming, we, we, we hope for the coming of Jesus. But in our present life, there are things that you and I would pray and need and ask for. And if we believe in God, then that is faith in action. And this may be very basic, but uh, our understanding of faith will increase as our study in Genesis continues as we look at the word faith. The second phrase is the evidence of things not seen. Evidence. Evidence in, in, is something which uh, we would simply say the proof. The proof. All right. Not sin. Ah. The word sin in the Greek is blepo. Blepo. It means to look at, to perceive. But this word is very unique. It also denotes simply that a person is voluntarily observing. It's voluntary observation. And you and I know that there are many ways to look. Right? It could be looking, just glancing, glancing, or looking by staring. You know, sometimes you stare at people intensely when you don't like them or you, 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 you're trying to find out the details and you look very hard. So there are many ways of look. And, and we will explore this word further when we get to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 in our next study. Because this word is very important in our understanding of Hebrews 11, verse 1. But for now, we need to just understand that Faith is the evidence, it's the proof of things that we have not yet seen. Have not yet seen. All right? And you may be saying, Pastor John, what's, what's wrong with you? How can there be proof when you have not yet seen it? Faith is the substance of something you know that is coming but you have not seen it yet. That is faith. 
On the other hand, faith isn't wishful thinking. It isn't something like, I hope it won't rain tomorrow. That may be wishful thinking. Or many of our Christian friends today, would, we would call it blab it and grab it, meaning you think you pray in Jesus' name is a secret formula. Whatever you say, you will get it. That's wishful thinking. No. Faith is based on the word of God. And faith is able to say, I may not see it presently. I may not even be able to understand it intellectually. Or I may, it may not be my experience right now. But I know, because God has said it, He will do it. He will do it. That is faith. And Hebrews 11, if you have time, read through it. There are many amazing verses that tells us how the other men of God have exercised their faith. So the faith here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it's not just about a set of moral virtues, nor is it a mental agreement or lip service to a religion. And faith is not just about having faith for a miracle to happen, but faith in chapter 11 verse 1 is explained by the previous verse because we have to understand it in the context in the context of hebrews chapter 10 verse 39 which was just a verse before chapter 11 verse 1 verse 39 reads but we are not of those who string back to destruction but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. I think we have a slide for that. Verse 39 clearly tells us that we are not like those who string back and goes into destruction, but we are those who have faith to the preserving of the souls. The word string back in the Greek kupostole, kupostole. It means to fall away, actually. It's apostasy. And it's a very strong word because it's used only once here. And God wants to tell us, if you have fallen away from your faith, you will go to destruction in hell. And having said that, the next verse tells us what faith looks like. And in verse 1, we must understand that verse 1 speaks about salvation. And that's where all of us must start. Faith that starts us out as we put our trust in Jesus to receive salvation, to save us from the wrath of God. And after that, after that, we do have to exercise faith thereafter, to trust, to continue to have faith in Jesus, to help us, to empower us, so that we may live a life of obedience to Him. So, faith is ex exercised throughout our life. And faith must be directed at Jesus because He is the object of our faith. Trusting Him for our eternal life and our abundant life. And yes, eternal life is yet future, but we can experience abundant life now. And today we must trust Jesus also for our protection, for our healing, our health, and our provision. 
and our gifts. And while all this sometimes is future, we need to trust Jesus for it. Because if you, you can see it, then you don't need faith. If your eyes can see it, then you don't need faith. If today you have a million dollars in your pocket, you don't have to trust Jesus for your provision. You think you can solve all your problems with it, one million dollars. You don't need faith. If you can see it, then you don't need faith. But it's because you can't see it, then we need to exercise faith. So faith really is the support structure underneath us for all our hopes. Faith is the proof of the things we have not seen. It's the proof. It is as if it has already happened. Now, I just want to be very clear here. Yes, we are all saved by grace, through faith, because that's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The word walk again is there. By grace we are saved. True faith. And after being saved, good works must follow. That's why we always say, it is grace alone that saves. But the grace that saves is not alone. Grace given, faith must be exercised from us, it follows, and good works must also follow closely behind. So, the, the question again, and I, I know there are many questions in, that you may want to ask, and I'm just trying to preempt them, and uh, questions like, is faith something I have in my inner self? Or is it something I need to do? Is faith something that I can do or exercise to have more faith? Or is faith something given to me? I, I, I believe it is a little of all three. And if we put them all together, we will have a fuller picture of what faith really means. And I want you to be patient because we are just starting at the very basic understanding of what faith is. And we are going to develop this over the course of our studies. It cannot be explained in 30 minutes what faith is. But this picture will become fuller and richer. Let me give you an example. A spiritually dead man cannot do anything to save himself. His, his, and and you, you can tempt him with the best food. He has no hunger. He has no desire. He's dead. But a spiritually dead man can acknowledge his condition. He can admit, and he must admit that he is dead. And he wants to leave. And then he can cry out to Jesus for help. He can cry out to Jesus for life because only Jesus can give life. For example, you remember the account of a father desperately going to Jesus in Mark chapter 9, verse 24. That boy was possessed by a demon. And it was the father who went to Jesus and pleaded with Jesus to heal the boy. In Mark chapter 9, verse 
24, we read, Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. It wasn't the faith of the demon-possessed boy that healed him. Neither was it the faith of his father because he, he admitted himself that he did not have the faith. Help my unbelief. But he wanted to believe and he cried out to Jesus to help his unbelief. And you know what? Jesus gave him both grace and faith to believe. If for some of you today who do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, he's not your God, he's not your Lord, he's not your Savior. Can I ask, do you admit that you're a sinner? That means you're spiritually dead. Do you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Or have you called out to Jesus to come into your life to be your God? And I'm sure some of you would say, yes, yes. Yes, I did all that. But listen carefully. The question is, is he your God? Is he your God in your life? That is the question. So moving on, before we take a look at how by faith, Noah allowed God to be God in his life, in our next study, let us pause to take a quick self-check. Is God the, the God of your life? Many would claim that they believe. But the question is, has your life changed? To be more like Jesus. And some of us would say, I know that God hates sin. But the question is this, am I afraid to hurt God with my sins? Do I hate and avoid sin? That is another check. Another check we can ask ourselves is, some of us may say, I believe that soon I will be standing before Jesus to give an account for my life. But the question is this, does my conduct bring honor to the name of Jesus? Or some of us may say, I know that this world is wicked, hollow, and it will all pass away soon. This old world earth will disappear and destroy. But the question is, am I attracted to it? Have I sold my soul in exchange for the stuff, the material things in this world that will soon perish with this planet? Have you? Or some of us may even say, I believe that God will supply all my needs. But the question is this, am I fearful about tomorrow? How am I going to pay the bills? Where am I going to find a job? How am I going to deal with this poor health that I'm in? And what about the children that I'm struggling with? Will you trust God to supply all your needs? And we say we believe in prayer, that prayer is a privilege for me to talk to my heavenly father. And God wants me to be diligent students of the Bible so that when I study it, I will know the mind of Jesus. Question is, how much time have I spent with Jesus and his word? 
we've been all been at home for the last two months. How many of us have taken the time to read through the whole Bible? In the two months, you could have done it. Or spend time to study, meditate, and memorize the word. How much time have we given to that? And lastly, some of us may be able to say, I believe that Jesus is coming back again. But the question is, have I been carefully keeping my lamb filled with oil and burning bright? Being filled with oil would imply that we are energized by the Holy Spirit, allowing Him to control us so that He can live His life through us. God can live His life through us so that we'll be burning bright. Or have our lights gone out like those foolish virgins? And Up to this point, how are you doing? And I have to ask myself too, how am I doing? And if we are honest, we must say that we are not doing very well in the eyes of God because all, that's all that matters. What's the grade that God is going to give me? What's the grade that God's going to give you? And that's the reason why many churches today are dying. Christians who claim to be born again, who claim to be disciples, are not allowing Jesus to be God in their lives. And Jesus said that in the last days, many will be deceived by the devil and many will fall away. Is that a picture of your life? If you are having problem trusting in Jesus, learn from Noah. Learn from Noah. And God, having painted a picture of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, God now moves on to give us many real-life examples of godly people in Hebrews 11. And one such person was Noah, who demonstrated faith who exercised faith as he walked with God, meaning God, Noah allowed God to be God in his life. And in closing, I'm going to read verse 7 of Hebrews 11 for you again. Hebrews 11 verse 7. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Wow. It is a verse that is packed with so many good things. And in our next study, just from this one single verse alone, God is going to give us a, a, a picture, a painting, a, a high-definition picture of what faith looks like. Oh, I, I shouldn't say high-definition because today we have ultra-high-definition and all that. And as we study on in the book of Genesis and the Bible, our understanding of faith will be deeper and richer. And the colors will be so beautiful. And our understanding will be deeper. So the question that we have to ask ourselves right now as we close, what do you think that God is saying to you today. 
Yes, Noah was righteous and blameless because he walked with God. And we remember Enoch also walked with God for 300 years after he became a father. He walked with God. Both Noah and Enoch walked consistently, continually in obedience, following God. By faith, both of them believed in everything God said. And having said, they know that God would do whatever God has said. That is faith. So again, faith is the concrete, concrete structure, solid structure, real structure, permanent structure that holds up the things we hope for. As we think of all the promises, we know God would fulfill. Faith is also the evidence, the proof of things that has not happened yet. But we know it will happen because that's how Enoch and Noah lived by. They had faith in God and his word. And both of them were pleasing in the eyes of God. This is also what God would expect from us. That we must walk by faith in Jesus and his word. So can I challenge you? If you are born again, if you are a disciple of Jesus, then walk by faith in Jesus. Direct your faith at Jesus and his word. And it will be a concrete structure that would hold you up. For those of you who today, you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus is not your God. Can I urge you to repent of your sins and take the first step of faith by trusting in Jesus to save your soul by admitting that you're a sinner, believing that Jesus died for you on the cross. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. And then you call out to Jesus, ask him to come into your life to be your God. God bless.